Hey church, I hope you're doing well. So let me ask you, do you like division? You know, if I wrote out a, a big, long division problem, would you get excited about it? Get your juices flowing, you'd be all pumped. Yay, division! Let's go math. I'm not really talking about that kind, so I'm sorry if you got excited. I, I, I'm talking about a different kind of division. Do, do you like dividing things up, categorizing things, separating things out so you can handle them better? Or maybe just because you're that type of person and you like this stuff. Let's say, for instance, I gave you a bag of M&Ms. Would you like to pour them out and arrange them by color? Browns over here, yellows over here, blues, reds, greens, you know. Sort them according to their color, divide them out, arrange them. W would that make you feel nice? Like you've accomplished something? Like... Like the world is lined up because your M&Ms are color coordinated. Then you could eat them according to your favorite color. Uh, you save the best for last, right? So you'd maybe gobble all the browns down first and save the blues to the end. I, I don't know how you work. But do you like division? Or are you kind of indifferent? Maybe you get the bag of M&Ms and you just pour them in your mouth because they're tasty. And it makes no difference. For me... I'm a little bit of a mixed bag. It, it just depends kind of on my mood. Sometimes I like to do that dividing thing. Sometimes I find that fun and I've, you know, made trees and pyramids and designs and patterns and I've eaten colors first and others last and all of that stuff. Other times I just pour the stuff right in my mouth and I don't worry a thing about it. It just depends. And really, when it comes to M&Ms, division's not important. The color makes no difference. They all taste the same. Don't tell me otherwise. I won't believe you. They all taste the same. Division of M&Ms does not matter. Other candies though, it makes a difference. Say for instance, it was the same scenario except for you replaced it with runts instead of M&Ms. If you gave that same bag of candy to me and it was full of colorful runts, I would divide right away before I did anything else. Super important that you divide the runts for me. I don't like the fruit cocktail. I don't want the mixture. One flavor at a time. Reds would come towards me, a few of them, not even all of them, just some of the red in my pile straight away. Everything else goes away from me towards Krista and Silas, my wife and my son, they enjoy that other candy. They can eat all the rest of it, even most of the reds. Here, it's yours. And then I take it one step further, one more division to be had, yellow in another pile. I take the yellow, which are those banana ones, you know, they're even shaped like a little banana, and I push them to the side all the way off the table until they land in the trash because that's where they belong. Yellow runts go straight into the garbage. Nowhere else is acceptable for them. They're nasty. Can you eat those things? Some of you are offended. I apologize. I know they make them because there's people out there that like them. I'm not that person. For me, yellow runts need to go right into the garbage can, and I don't care if they ever make them again, except for if they make you happy, then I'm happy for you. You enjoy the yellow runs. For me, they go in the trash. But in that case, division becomes important because I don't like everything there. I don't enjoy the flavor of everything there. It's important for me to separate out that which is good and that which is really nasty. Red is good, banana is really nasty. And I need to know the difference. I need to divide. It's important if I want to enjoy that candy. Now I know, candy's not the most important thing in the world, but these kinds of things, when it's good to divide and when it sh things shouldn't be divided, it's important to know that as we live our life. When should we separate out things and when should we keep things together? And this is especially true in our spiritual life in our walk with God, in our fellowship with Jesus, in our discipleship, in our following of the Lord. We need to know how and when it's good to divide and when things are meant to stay together. You see, I think in our culture, 
in our society, we have this habit of dividing things out of God that were never meant to be divided. We look at some attributes of God and consider them as like oil and water that they don't mix. But in reality, they are attributes of God that, that go together. You can't divide God out in the way that the church has done or the culture has done at times. And instead, things need to be together and we need to rethink a few things. You see, we've been in this series where we're rethinking some stuff, rethinking about our ideas of God and, and basing them on the Bible, on Scripture. We want that to be the truth, the foundation for us. And so we need to rethink our ideas about God. And then later we're going to look at rethinking how we view ourselves and rethinking how we view others. But today I want us to rethink how we have divided God into two separate categories and understand that really they're in the same place. They should not be separated. These are two attributes of God that belong together. So what am I talking about? Holiness and love. Holiness and love. You see, a lot of times the church are, are people who, who try to follow Christ or call themselves Christians get into this argument. Our God is a holy God. He expects no sin, flawlessness. God is a God who is holy, righteous, pure, set apart, other. And people stand on that truth and fight against those who, who say something that appears or sounds at times to be opposite. No, no, no. We, we don't want to talk about that. Our God is a God of love. Our God is a God of grace. Our God is a God of mercy. Our God is a God of forgiveness. And people can kind of divide or separate into the, these two camps. God is love. God is holy. God is love. God is holy. Whichever side you want to put that on, you can, we can be divided along that line with one group saying God is holy and one group saying God is love when what both groups should be saying God is love and God is holy. And these two things aren't separated. God is both together, not to be divided especially not to be divided along those terms. Yes, it, it can be helpful in our understanding uh, to look at one characteristic of God, say his holiness and the attributes of God's holiness, or we look at God's love and the attributes of God's love, but the overarching framework needs to keep in mind uh, that these are just attributes of God who is at, in one nature, one God, not divisible, not divided up, so that holiness and love exist together and in fact are complementary of one another. And you would be missing out on a lot if you tried to divide these apart. This is not banana runs and red runs. This is both together indivisible. Like, uh, you know, solid piece of chocolate that you can't meet out two different types of chocolate from, not coming apart. Holy God, loving God, both describe the same God. As an example of this, today I'm, I'm going to look at uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and we're going to look at the fifth chapter and starting in verse 25. And it's interesting here that, that Paul isn't necessarily trying to describe God in, its, in God's entirety. He's not really going through this theological description about holiness and love. Instead, God's writing to a particular group of people, and in this case, he's, he's writing to husbands, a gentleman who are married, and he's, he's giving marital advice. But even in this context, we can see holiness and love working together and how they complement one another, and we can learn about God's nature through looking at this verse, at these verses. So listen to what Paul says here in Ephesians 5. Again, we're starting in verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. Paul starts out with something that should be relatively obvious. Husbands, love your wives. Start there. 
In fact, you know, if you look at scripture on a broader scope, you can see uh, this command for people to love one another, for us to love each other out, even outside of marriage uh, as a commandment of God. So this, this should be a no-brainer. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Okay, that got a little tougher. Husbands, love your wives, dot, dot, dot. Just as Christ loves the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands, love your wives in that sacrificial way, in that life-giving way. Give yourselves up for your wives. And again, this could be extended beyond that marital relationship or beyond a, a guy's role as a husband. Love one another, dot, 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 as Christ loved the church in a sacrificial way, in a way that you're willing to lay your life down for another. This is the love that you're called to. And Paul continues to make her holy, to make her holy. Husbands, love your wives. Why? To make them holy, just as Christ loved the church. Christ loved the church. Why? To make us holy. God gave of his son. He showed his love. He demonstrated his love through Jesus, who, who laid down his life not to escape this idea of holiness, but to make us holy, to transform us into God's image, to make us filled with love and holiness. Christ's love served uh, a lot of purposes, but one of them was to make us holy. And Paul is saying that we should do the same. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. God so loved the world, not in this way that is apart from his holiness or separated from his holiness, but in a way that, that offers God's holiness to the church so that one day the church may come before the Lord without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. And this is the call that, that Paul gives to us as believers, that we're to love one another in this way. That, that we're not to look at love as this thing, as this idea that we just uh, accept whatever, welcome whatever, whatever flaws about somebody else that we, that we don't wish something better for them, but that we lay our lives down for one another that we might be lifted up into holiness that we might submit ourselves before the Lord and before each other, that, that holiness might be the result. Love and holy aren't two warring camps, two divisions uh, of M&Ms or whatever it is that fight against each other. Instead, they are two aspects, two characteristics of one God who can be fully described as being love and holy. And he wants for us to do the same, to be described in the same way, to look at love and holiness as compatible, as things that go together, as necessary to our life, not as something that we divide out or separate. A while back, I was uh, at this restaurant I used to like, and they offered this thing called the Elvis Burger. And at first I looked at it and thought, whew, I'm not sure that that goes together. You mean you got a bacon cheeseburger and you're putting peanut butter on it? I like bacon cheeseburgers. I like peanut butter. But this description said, it'll make you all shook up. 
you know, like Elvis. I'm all shook up. And I looked at that and thought, oh, I'm not sure. And so the first time I went to the restaurant, you know, I, I passed it up. Wasn't going to get it. And I went to this restaurant kind of frequently, and, and it took a while. But eventually I was like, all right, I'm in. Maybe I need to be shook up just a little bit in, in my food thoughts and how I view these things. And so I said, I'll take the Elvis. Give it to me. Go on for it. It was delicious. It was wonderful. I'll eat a peanut butter bacon cheeseburger from a reputable restaurant anytime. Now I think those things are awesome. This is that, but on a much grander level. If you're used to viewing holiness as being something that's separated from love, especially in relationship with God, these things go together better than peanut butter and jelly or better than a bacon cheeseburger and with peanut butter on top. Things that wouldn't necessarily seem to fit, but in reality, they cannot be divided. Christ loved you so much that he gave himself for you. And the end goal of that is that you might be holy and blameless and righteous, and that you might meet Jesus face to face and stand before him cleansed and pure, without wrinkle or stain or any other blemish, but holy and blameless before the Almighty God. Friends, I encourage you to embrace these characteristics of God in your life. Love, yes. Holiness, yes. Holy love, together as one. For this is God's plan. This is God's nature. This is what God has for you. Would you seek the Lord in his holiness? Would you seek the Lord in his love? And would you do that as you love others? Would you lay your life down for others that they might experience the holiness of God as well? In Jesus' name, for his sake, amen.